We will be in Ephesians chapter 3 today, so turn there uh, to Ephesians 3, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 6. We'll be in Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 6. And as you get there, you know, our culture loves innovators, inventors, uh, right? We think highly of those who come up with new ideas, uh, new products, new ways of doing things. Uh, we can think of those certainly in our cultural history uh, that are enshrined as people known for innovating. Uh, one of the ones that immediately jumped to my mind was Thomas Edison, right? We think of Thomas Edison as someone who is uh, a high innovator, an inventor. Uh, he uh, really uh, worked in the world to, to further our understanding. Uh, and we can see the way that we enshrine those people as innovators, such as Thomas Edison, in the cultural kind of conversation against Thomas Edison. Right? We, we hear of people who were in Thomas Edison's day who probably surpassed him in geniusness. All right? And so we want to elevate those people and say, you thought Thomas Edison was an innovator? Well, what about Tesla right? or, or whomever we may raise as an, an alternative? Uh, and even in the way that we talk about, well, Edison, he didn't really innovate. He stole. All right, we, and we have those kinds of conversations sometimes about innovators. They're not really innovators. Uh, they just stole someone else who was the real innovator, and we need to tell their story and forget this guy, uh, Edison, or whoever it may be. We could go back even further than that, though, and we could think of someone like Leonardo da Vinci. Right? He was an innovator. Uh, he was an intelligent man, so much so that there are even books that we can go to and read how to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. That is literally the title of a book that you can go and get uh, because we have this idea that we want to be innovators. We want to be innovative. We want to be inventors. We want to be known for furthering culture, furthering technology, furthering industry. Uh, this is what we uh, love as a culture. But as we consider religion, as we consider the scriptures, I think it's helpful to ask the question, should we be innovators? Right? We take it as a, a cultural uh, milestone or a cultural uh, just idea or more or a norm that we should always be innovating. And as we come to the scriptures, should we carry the American cultural impetus to innovate into it? Maybe we think that without novelty, religion grows cold and detached from reality. Well, today, as we consider Paul's letter to the Ephesians, one of the things that we're going to see is that Paul was not an innovator. Paul was not an innovator. He did not set out to create a new religion with new ideas and new ways of doing things. Instead, Paul describes himself as a receiver of revelation. And what did the content of God's revelation to him entail? And so this is what I want us to understand today from our passage, that God's purpose and salvation is the inclusion of the most unlikely to be the recipients of his grace. And this is what was true from the very beginning, but is especially true as we come to understand the gospel, right? That God's purpose and salvation is the inclusion of, of the most unlikely to be the recipients of his grace. So let's read our passage today, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. God's word reads, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I've written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, 
and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And this is the word of the Lord, and I pray that you receive it as such. So as we come to this passage, uh, one of the important things for our understanding is that the background to this passage is everything that we have read thus far in the book of Ephesians. And I know that may be like, well, duh. Uh, But even more so, Paul's not uh, deviating from his argument, but he's actually relying upon everything that he's uh, written about thus far. And we'll see that as we go along, how, how dependent this section is on what has come before. But what do we know about this letter, right? He opens up with a blessing to God. Uh, He moves on to a prayer of thanksgiving to God. And then in chapter 2, we come to these wonderful words of Scripture, some of the most perhaps famous verses in the whole of the Bible, uh, where we are saved by grace through faith, right? That that identification. We once were dead in our trespasses and sins, and now we are made alive in Christ. And then the latter half of chapter 2, we talk about this issue of who we were as Gentiles, as outside of God's chosen people, and who we are now made to be in Christ, which is united to God's people, uh, all of God's people who in faith serve and worship him. And so all these things, all these things bear in mind as we come to this passage today. And I want us to see first mystery stewarded in verses one through three, mystery stewarded. And Paul begins in chapter 3 verse 1 for this reason and I want to pause here and just say what Paul is writing uh, becomes a large digression Uh, so he begins in verse 1 to say something and he doesn't say it until we get down to verse 13 Uh, it's just a large digression there actually is no complete sentence in verse 1 uh, some translations make it into a complete sentence, but I think that uh, I think that does against what Paul's trying to do. Uh, Paul is interrupted. He has thought interrupted. And by the way, this is something we know about Paul, right? He kind of writes this way and sometimes where he just like, he starts writing a certain point and then all of a sudden he's like, I got to have a moment of praise right here and then we'll get back to what we're talking about. But Paul writes, uh, he writes an incomplete thought here. And he begins with, for this reason. And again, what's this reason? Well, it's because of God's work to change Gentile Christians from death to life. God's work to change Gentile Christians from outside of uh, the family of God to into the family of God. To become sons and daughters. And he really wants to encourage them, uh, even as he's in prison on their behalf. Uh, Right, if we jump down to verse 13 and so finish the thought of verse 1, Paul writes, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory, which is your glory. Sorry. So he begins the thought in verse 1, finishes in 13, and his thought is, I don't want you to be discouraged about what's happening to me. I want you to be encouraged. And indeed, he goes on in verses 14 and following to describe his prayer for them to that end, that they would be encouraged. For this reason, for this cause, I, Paul, and again, I want to mention here briefly that there are those scholars, especially in the modern day, who argue that this letter is not written by Paul. And so I think it's important to comment here upon upon this because the author of this letter says, I, Paul. Now, it may be possible that in Paul's day, it was okay to write in the name of someone else on their behalf and in their uh, vein of thinking and that it was okay to do so. But I also want to note that the early church often rejected such letters. Uh, They were pseudonymous letters, meaning that they were written as though they were from that person without actually being from that person. And anytime we see this in the early church, the early church typically rejected those letters as not authentic, uh, as not really coming from them, and so not scripture. They may have good encouragements in them, but they don't rise to the level of scripture. They don't hold it as scripture as they do other letters. 
And so I think we should receive this letter as the early church received this letter from the hand of Paul. Uh, and I think we, we get reason for that. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, I, Paul, right? And how does he describe himself? He describes himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Now, two things could be meant here by this, right? As we read this, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, it could be meant uh, like Paul sometimes describes himself as a slave of Christ Jesus, right? We see that, for instance, in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, where Paul writes, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. It could be that. I think it's more likely that what Paul is talking about is he is actually in prison because of his testimony about Christ Jesus, right? Paul is a prisoner because of Christ, because of his testimony of Christ. Right, we could, and and we will look at the book of Acts uh, to to see how Paul is put in prison because he believes in Christ. It seems like that's the intended meaning here. Right, we could look at Philippians one where he describes himself as a prisoner because of Christ. Right, so another context in which he is uh, in prison. But I want you to turn with me to Acts twenty two. Uh, Acts twenty two. And I want us to look at a, a larger section here of Paul's testimony about himself and why he would write and say, I'm in prison because of Christ on behalf of you Gentiles. Because notice that's the last part of verse 1. I'm a Paul, a Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. So why is that? Um, Acts 22, the context here, Paul's just been arrested. He had gone to the temple to worship, and there were some Jews uh, from outside of Jerusalem there also, and they saw Paul, and they presumed that Paul, knowing that he was often with Gentiles, had brought Gentiles into the temple and in past the court of the Gentiles. Right? The, the Gentiles could come into the court of the Gentiles, but they could go no further. They couldn't go deeper into the temple complex, uh, and actually it was on pain of death if a Gentile crossed beyond that barrier where they could go, uh, because that's what God had commanded, right? And they had interpreted that in that way. And so Paul, uh, he's arrested. Uh, there, there's a riot that starts to happen, and the Romans come and kind of break up the riot, but they arrest Paul because he's at the center of it, right? Uh, and so I want us to read Acts 22, verses 1 through 8, and then we'll jump down and kind of finish with 17 through 22, but you can go back later and read the whole thing and listen to Paul's testimony. Uh, but Paul wants to address the Jewish people, and he addresses them. Uh, verse 40 of chapter 21 says in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I will now make before you. And when he heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet, and he said, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus in Cilicia. But brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near Damascus about noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Let's jump down to verse 17. When I had returned to Jerusalem, was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance. And saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving, watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. So, why was Paul in prison? 
because he believed that the message of Christ should be delivered to the Gentiles. That, yes, Gentiles can and should be saved. And the Jews hate him for it, right? They listen until they hear this word Gentile. Go, I'm going to send you to the Gentiles. God's saying that, that he's going to send someone to the Gentiles. And they say, forget you, away with you, die, be dead. They believe the Jews are an abomination. Uh, they believe the Gentiles are an abomination. Sorry. But by the way, so do the Gentiles believe the Jews are an abomination. Uh, we see that throughout the scripture. Um, back, you could go as far back as Joseph and his family as they enter into Egypt. Uh, the Egyptians thought shepherds were unclean and dirty and unfit to live next to. And so, all right, they, they say, go live in this other land away from us. All right, so even there we have this uh, division, uh, this hostility. And by the way, that hostility has not ceased. Uh, matters in, current, in, in our current day and age, right, testify to that, that there is still hostility between Jew and Gentile. And all this is to say Paul's in prison because he was called to go to the Gentiles and preach. He is in jail because of the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was called to go to a people, right? Go back to Ephesians 2.12. He's called to go to a people. He says, he writes to them right in here, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That's to whom Paul was commanded to go and preach the message of reconciliation. Well, so Paul writes, for this reason, I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, dot, dot, dot. And then he digresses and we get to that digression and starting in verse two. Right. And he says, he writes, assuming uh, or if indeed. And again, we have this strange way for Paul to write. And again, this is one reason that scholars say that this is not written by Paul, because uh, assuming that you have heard. Did the Ephesians know who Paul was? Yes. Uh, yeah, quite quite extensively. So Acts 20, 31, as this is before Paul goes to Jerusalem to be arrested and imprisoned and and all the rest. Uh, he actually calls for the elders of the Ephesian church to come and meet with him. And they know that this is going to be their last meeting together, that Paul will not see them again. That much has been made clear uh, to Paul uh, through the spirit, through prophets. Uh, so this is a last meeting with the pastors of the Ephesian church. And he writes in Acts 20, 31, he says this to them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish every one of you with tears. So we know Paul was at least with the Ephesians for three years. So we come back here to Ephesians, right? This is a letter written to the Ephesian church. And he's saying, assuming that you have heard, have they heard about Paul? Yeah. He was with them for three years. So why is Paul writing this way? Some take this to mean that this isn't really Paul writing. And so this is someone kind of writing in his stead. And, and they're just like, you know, uh, don't you remember me kind of thing? Uh, but I think there's three good valid reasons that we don't have to write assuming here as meaning someone else wrote it. Uh, I think there's three good reasons, at least, that we could deal with this language. The first is that Paul could be writing to this church knowing that there are going to be new converts among them that have not heard of his ministry, as, as maybe some of the others who had been there from the beginning have. Right? So he's writing to them and he's saying, assuming you have heard. Have you heard from your fellow church members about me, about who I am, about my ministry, how I admonished every one of you with tears for three years? The second thing is that a legion, uh, Ephesians, remember, could be a circular letter, meaning that this was a letter that was first delivered to Ephesus, but then also was delivered to other churches in the area. And so this could be uh, an, a writing to affect them. 
right? To say, uh, you know, you may not be in Ephesus, but have you heard from the Ephesians who I am? Have you heard about my ministry from the Ephesians and why I was there and why I preached? The third thing is it could just be a rhetorical way for Paul to speak saying, don't you remember me? Don't you know my ministry? Don't you know why I am here and why I'm in prison and why I'm writing to you? Don't you know why you are saved in Christ? Paul was the means, right, that God had used that they would hear the gospel and believe. Paul didn't save them, right? We go to Corinthians for that. Paul was planted, I watered, but God gave the growth. And assuming you have heard what, right? Verse 2, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship or the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. So what does Paul want the Ephesians to remember, right? The stewardship of God's grace that was given to him for them. So let's consider the stewardship of God's grace given to him. Remember that Paul was called by God to be an apostle. Paul did not choose to be an apostle. Paul did not choose to be a Christian. Right? He was adamantly opposed to Christianity. He says as much in his, back in Acts 22, right? When his testimony there, and his, when he's trying to uh, speak to the Jewish people, he says, don't you know I persecuted the way? I persecuted Christians. And even when Stephen was there and he was being stoned to death, as boulders were being cast at him, as his bones were being broken, as his flesh was being cut open and the blood was pouring out, I was there and I approved of it. We know the modern political messaging, ad messaging, right? It always has to include, I approve of this message, right? Paul approved of the message that was sent when Stephen was killed, was murdered. He celebrated the destruction in his zeal for the things of God. He celebrated the destruction of Christians. And Christ intervened, right? He interrupted Paul's plans. He stopped Paul in his tracks literally, and changed him forever. God had grace on Paul. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me. God had grace on Paul. God showed him unearned favor. And in this, he entrusted Paul with a mission. He called Paul to be an apostle. He made him a minister of the gospel. And so too, by the way, today, ministers of the gospel are given a stewardship of grace. But first we can speak more broadly about all Christians, right? All Christians are saved by grace through faith. It's not of their own doing. If you are in Christ, it's not of your own doing. It is Christ. You are not in Christ because you chose your way to get to heaven. No, God interrupted your life and Christ intervened and you were saved. But let's take this more narrowly and let's think about the stewardship of God's grace given to those who are called as elders. They are called by God as elders to that role. Uh, later in this letter in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, Paul will write, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Uh, shepherds, they're being pastors, right? So God gave, that's such an important word. God gave to the church these men and these offices. God did it. God gave it. Even Paul acknowledges that to himself, uh, about himself here, right? Assuming you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me. Why do, I, why do I emphasize this? Because let us marvel first that God uses means to accomplish his purposes. For he uses mere men to steward his grace. 
right? That's what God does. Uh, and we could uh, look, for instance, at Titus 1, uh, 7 and following, where Paul writes there, for an overseer as God's steward. So let's just stop in there, and you could go on and read about what that overseer, what that pastor, what that elder, it, who he is to be like. But I just want to pause and consider that as God's steward. What is a steward? Uh, he would be the lead servant in a house. He would be the one that the master of the house gives authority to, to manage his house. So what's the point of this? Paul is a steward. He's a manager. He is not the master. He's not the owner. He's a servant. And a stewardship was given to him. An administration was given to him. Just as elders are given a stewardship, an administration, not for their benefit, but as Paul writes to Ephes in Ephesians 4.12, right? To equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. So Paul's a steward. He's a minister. He's a servant of Christ for the sake of the Gentiles, right? And, and that's, that's his reality, right? That he is given a stewardship of grace for them. It was for their benefit. And did the Ephesian church benefit by Paul's ministry? How else would they have heard of Christ without his faithfulness and the stewardship given to him for their benefit? We go on in verse 3 and we see how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. The mystery. Now this is something that Paul uses that word a lot here in these verses. And we can ask the question, well, what is the mystery? The mystery of the mystery. Right, we could maybe write a nice little children's novel about that. Someone take that title and run with it. Jack, looking at you. No. Uh, right, what is the mystery? Well, first let's see right that it was made known to him by revelation. Paul did not invent Christianity. Right? So let, I, I want to emphasize that so many times today, and I'll, I'll say it again and again, and, and a little bit later I'll say why I say it again and again. Paul did not invent Christianity. He did not innovate on Judaism. He did not look at Judaism and say, you know what needs to happen here? We need a reno. We need, to, we need a fresh coat of paint on this thing. We need to you know, take out that wall, and, and let's do a cool arch over here, and, and let's get some crown molding, and then this will make it really the Cadillac of religions, and then we'll be, we'll be good to go. He didn't innovate. No, how did Paul receive the mystery? By God, from God, right? God gave him the content of the mystery. The second thing to note here is, right, he says, as I have written briefly. Now, this is not in reference to Paul's other letters. This is not Paul saying, look to my other letters, but it's really referring back up to Ephesians 1 and 2. Uh, right, he's saying, as I have written thus far briefly, uh, you may know these things that I have been, that the revelation uh, was made known to me, that the mystery was made known to me. So that's why I said at the beginning, the context for these verses is Ephesians 1 and 2, what we have read thus far. We can go back to chapter 1, for instance, and find part of what the mystery is in Ephesians 1, <laughs> verses 9 and 10. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Paul writes, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So what's the mystery? Part of the mystery is that Christ is going to unite all things. He's going to unite all things in heaven and on earth. And God's purpose for Christ is the unity of his people and the reconciliation of his creation. And we come to understand, understand the specificity of what this mystery is and what the content of it is down in verse 6. And we'll look at that in a little bit. But right, so Paul actually explains there what the mystery is, so, but we'll get there. But to sum up this first section, here we have Paul. He's the receiver of grace. He was given the revelation of the mystery of God's plan of salvation 
For what point? The sake of the Gentiles. Right? The, this was all for the sake of others. And what we need to understand in this day is that this mystery is given to Paul for our benefit. Paul is still the apostle to the Gentiles. Though he is asleep in Christ, he still speaks to us today through the God-breathed word we have before us. Brothers and sisters, rest your faith upon the unchanging word of God and know that Paul didn't innovate upon the Jewish faith to come up with something new and shiny. He didn't have a brainstorm session one night in his dorm room and say, uh, here, here we go, here's where, where we need to go with this. And we too should not strive for innovation when it comes to the word of God. In our day, novelty is popular, right? A again, as our culture, the cultural impetus of that which motivates and moves our culture is novelty, is newness. We crave it. Indeed, the makers of your smartphones know it. Why do they re release an incremental upgrade every year? Because it's new. Ooh. Why do your s social media apps, why are they designed that the way that they are to show you things you haven't seen before every time you open it up? Because they know something of our brain chemistry that when we open it up and we see something new, we get little tingles in our brain. Dopamine starts firing off and we feel good about ourselves for a moment. They know your brain lights up when you hear and see something new. They know your brain lights up when you're the first person to see that new meme and you can share it on. Because nothing's more disappointing, by the way, than to send your friend a meme and they say, oh yeah, I saw that two weeks ago, right? And then you're just like, man, my day's ruined, right? Right? They, they design their products that way because they know that's what we like. And this carries over into the church. Right? Understand, so that cultural, that cultural norm, that cultural impetus follows into the church. And you will hear men trying to innovate on the word of God. They try to bring improvements to it. They say things like, for instance, we have to unhitch the Old Testament from the New. Because the Old Testament's old, and we got to get rid of that. That holds people back. We just need the New Testament. And by the way, it's not too long before they say we need to unhitch the New Testament from Christianity. We need, we need new revelation. We need new word. We need to understand this in a new way that our forefathers did not know. They want to marvel you with novelty. Some churches never seem, seem to sing the same song twice. Because repetition is the highest sin. It's the mindset which says we don't want to sing about the old, old story of Jesus and his blood. We want to sing about the new, new innovations of man. And by the way, don't hear this as a polemic against change. Don't hear this as, a, uh, as I'm telling you change is bad. We always need to be reforming. But our reformation is in the ways of God in his word, not our innovations and imaginations. We can become guilty of stagnating in our traditions. We need creativity. God gave us imagination and creativity. God gave, it's, it's so interesting, go back and read the book of Exodus, and you see that God gave to certain men skill to make things beautiful for the tabernacle. So is God unconcerned with beauty? Not at all. He's the God of beauty. He himself is beauty. We know what beauty is because we know who God is, right? As he reveals himself, God created the flowers of the field that are here today and gone tomorrow. So don't hear this against creativity. Don't hear this as against reforming or change. But let us never depart from the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Let us not innovate on the word of God. Paul revealed to us what was given to him by God. And so let's see that next. The mystery 
revealed, mystery revealed in verses 4 and 5. Mystery revealed, and he, he writes in verse 4, when you read this, right? So when, when you read this letter, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ. Right, if we've read this letter thus far, we can understand that, yeah, Paul does know something about the mystery of Christ. He's explaining things about the mystery of Christ. Go back to chapter 2 and read, and you will see Paul's insight into the mystery of Christ, what it means for us as Gentiles. It's evident that Paul has received something from God, especially when we understand who Paul was before he received the insight that he received from God. Right? He was a Jew of Jews. Uh, he was in all ways zealous for the traditions of the elders of the Jewish faith. That was who he was. And yet God, right, Christ changed him. He was given special insight into the mystery of Christ's work. And suddenly the thing that he found most repulsive becomes the thing that he is most excited to see, the salvation of the Gentiles. He goes on in verse 5, you write, you can, when you read this, you perceive my insight. Verse 5, that the mystery of Christ, verse 5 here, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Right, the content of the mystery of Christ, Paul writes, has not been made known in ages past as it has now been revealed. Now here we have to ask the question, right? Didn't God speak to the prophets and say the Messiah would come? Yes, right? The Messiah and the purpose of the Messiah was made known. The purpose of God from ages past had been carried down. We could go back to Adam and Eve in the, in the fall, right? The, during the curse, there's that first gospel. The serpent's head is going to be bruised by the seed of the man. There is the rising sign in the Abrahamic covenant, right? Abraham, through you, the whole world is going to be blessed. And on and on, we could trace the contours of the message of, of God's gospel. We could trace God's purpose, even in the peculiarity of the Jewish people, right? In, in their long tassels, uh, in the sign of circumcision, and the things they eat and don't eat. All this was to be a sign to the peoples around them that they were different and that they worshiped the one true and living God. This was a sign to the Gentiles of something greater. So how can Paul write here? Well, that wasn't known back then. What I write to you now wasn't known back then. Well, what Paul is saying is that the knowledge of God's purpose of grace was not known then as it is now known in Christ. And it is only since the coming of Jesus that we have a fuller picture of what God has planned and purpose from the very beginning. Right? And remember that this is God's plan from the very beginning. Go back to chapter 1, and you see that he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. So you, brother and sister, you Gentile, God had purpose from before creation, your salvation, if indeed you are in Christ. But we didn't know that in full. It wasn't known in full. And we could trace through the book of Acts, for instance, how the early church has to grapple with that, deal with that. Right? We could look at Acts 10, for instance, and see how God worked in Peter to accept the Gentiles coming into the church. We could track that further development in the book of Acts. We could look at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And that's Paul's point here, is that the way that God was going to act in grace towards even the Gentiles was not known in ages past, but it is now known through the holy apostles and prophets. God revealed to his people something new in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. This was revealed by the Spirit. 
right? And we would do well to understand what, what Peter writes in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. He writes there, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And again and again, it bears repeating. Paul belabors this point, and so should we. He is a steward. It was a grace given to him. It was revealed to him. It was revealed to the holy apostles and prophets. And what's the point of all that language? To say Paul did not innovate. The apostles did not innovate. The prophets in the early church did not invent these things. God gave them the message. Right? As Peter writes, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's the reality. And the prophets... And the apostles were faithful to deliver what the Spirit gave them to speak. It is as Paul writes in the book of Romans, at the end of Romans in chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. Romans 16, 25 and 26. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Listen, we get similar language here. According to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. God's purpose has now been revealed. And notice through whom? The holy apostles and the prophets. Now that word holy modifies the apostles, and it's an interesting way to interesting phrase, an interesting way to write, because we don't see this elsewhere. Uh, we don't see this elsewhere in the New Testament. And maybe Paul uses that modifier here to indicate that they were ones uh, for what does holy mean, being holy mean, set apart. So the, I think he wants us. To, to be reminded here that the apostles were set apart. They were unique. They were distinct. To go back to the question we asked last week, are there apostles in the church today? No, they were unique and they were set apart and they were holy. And what about these prophets here? Again, the, the context makes clear that this is not Old Testament prophets. That's why the, the reference to that at the end of chapter 2 and, and verse 20 uh, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's why I don't think Paul's writing there about the Old Testament prophets, because he's not writing about them here, and, and we see this similar phrase, right? Uh, it's not Old Testament prophets because they didn't know about the mystery of Christ. They had a hint of it, but they didn't know the full revelation of it until Christ came and delivered that message. Only the prophets in the New Testament age received that revelation and made it known. And both of these groups, what does modify both of these groups here in our passage in verse 5, is that both of these groups spoke, they were revealed the, the message by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, or in the Spirit. They spoke in the Spirit. It was revealed to them in the Spirit. God revealed to them what His plan was from the foundation of the world in the Spirit. So it was not as though God was going along one day, by the way, and he just decided, you know what? Let's shake things up. Gentiles, come on in. Right? It wasn't just some whim that God had decided and said, this is what's going to happen. He wasn't like this whole religion thing. It's getting boring. The Jewish people, they're boring. Let's add in some spice. No, his purpose was always from the very beginning the inclusion of the Gentiles, even if he didn't always make it known in that way. Now this side of Christ, right, we can look back and see the fingerprints of God in those things. We can look at Genesis 
and say, oh, I can see how God was preparing for the inclusion of the Gentiles then. We could look at the prophets of the Old Testament and say, I can see how God was preparing for the inclusion of the Gentiles. There's breadcrumbs there. So Paul stewarded the mystery. He, God was the revealer of the mystery to him. And now let's see the mystery explained. Mystery explained, and this is in verse 6. Mystery explained. He said, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So this is the mystery. The mystery is that the Gentiles, again, who are the Gentiles? You and me, right? More, just just to say that, right? Uh, But more broadly referring to everybody who's outside of the nation of Israel. Right. Israel alone was God's chosen people. They had a distinct role in everyone outside of that nation, everyone outside of Israel, everyone who could not track their genealogy back through to say the time of Moses or earlier than that to the time of Abraham were the ethne, the Gentiles. And we come back to the latter half of chapter 2 of this letter where Paul writes just this point. Remember, that you Gentiles were outside of the family of God. You were outside of the nation of Israel. You were outside of the commonwealth. You were outside, and, and indeed, you were not just outside, you were without God in his promises. And now in Christ, because of God's purpose, the thing that God was accomplishing in Christ was that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise. Paul writes to the Galatians about this wonderful change in Galatians 3, 27 through 29. Galatians 3, 27 through 29. For as many as you were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Isn't that interesting what Paul writes there and how that applies to us here in Ephesians, right? He's saying you were outside, you were distinct, you were uh, hostile and at war with one another. You were like uh, you were at the Tower of Babel right? Unable to understand one another, at odds with one another, divided and divisive. And now you are brought together and you are united. And now these things that once set you apart and made you distinct and put you out of the family of God, you're now brought in. And if you're in Christ, then you are really Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Right, the promise of God to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations isn't fulfilled in Israel and in Edom. Right, it's not fulfilled through, his, through the line, the lineage of Isaac or Ishmael. Right, because remember that Abraham did have another child. What God says, what God's word says, is that the promise to Abraham is fulfilled in the work of Christ to make one people out of many. Indeed, even Jesus talks about this, and and we don't often see this, and I think it passed over the Jews of the day, even his own disciples, right, as they struggled to come to the terms of that in the book of Acts. Matthew 8.11. Matthew 8.11. This is on the occasion where a Gentile comes to him, a soldier comes to him, And asks for a miracle. And as he remarks upon this one's faith, he says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Paul did not innovate. Paul was just saying what Jesus said, right? That there are going to be some from all over the world of every ethnic tongue, tribe, and nation, like we see in the book of Revelation, right? That that's the reality, all coming and reclining at table with the patriarchs 
and worshiping God and feasting in the halls of heaven. The Gentiles will come and sit and feast with the patriarchs of the Jewish faith. That's a reality the Jewish people would not accept. We could look back to Paul's imprisonment in, in Acts 20 and see, right, as soon as he said, and I was sent to the Gentiles, what did they do? Stop up their ears, yell and scream. The crowd listens to him up to that point and no more. But God's purpose is fellowship, unity. And what we kind of miss in our English translation of, of this verse 6 is that uh, there's the same Greek prefix in front of all of these kind of uh, these little issues here, these little, little ideas. So we could translate this verse like this. We could say that this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members, and fellow partakers, fellow sharers of the promise. Right? And why do I say that? Because this, this word is what gathers us, right? Reunites us. We miss it in our English, but these things are related to one another. And that's intentional. <clears throat> The believing Jewish person and the believing Gentile person are united in faith in Christ Jesus through the gospel. And this last part is really important. How is this unity accomplished? Is it because government comes along and enacts a diversity and inclusivity uh, uh, measures? Is it because there's a, uh, a person identified in your corporate structure who is given to ensure the diversity of your company and the inclusivity of your company. No. Is it because we just set aside our perspectives and say, you know what? I'm going to just, I'm just going to give up my perspective and, and you can give up your perspective and then we'll kind of be perspectiveless. No. Why is there unity? Why can there be unity in this room uh, from people uh, with different classes and ages and ethnicities and backgrounds, education levels, etc. Only because of Christ. Only through the gospel. Right? The gospel of Christ changes us. It makes us different. Hebrew or if Hebrews. Ephesians 2:14. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh. The dividing wall of hostility. Ephesians 2.14 The mystery is this, that the Gentiles are not second-class citizens in the kingdom of God, but rather we who were outside of the kingdom of God in every way are brought in and made sons and daughters as the rest. We are made heirs. We are made members of the same body, Christ's church. We are partakers of the same promise. God has promised eternal life for all who call upon him, all who believe. And brothers and sisters, though you may come from pagan backgrounds, and even though your ancestors may have been the most defiled and impure, immoral, unholy people in all of the lands of this earth, in Christ, you can partake in his promise of eternal life. I'll go back and finish Paul's doxology and from Romans 16, Romans 16, 25 through 27, Romans 16, 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel in the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. God's purpose in salvation is the inclusion of the most unlikely to be the recipients of his grace. And friend, you may have obstinately opposed God, you may think that believing in Christ Jesus is silliness. You may believe that the word of God is most offensive, not because it talks about supernatural things, but because it offends your chosen identity. But God's grace is sufficient even for you. And if you believe in the good news of Jesus Christ, if you trust in him and his work, then you can be in fellowship with God. 
You can be a fellow partaker in his promise of eternal life. You will find that all the promise of, promises of God are in Christ Jesus. Yes and amen. You will find the forgiveness of your sins. Because as it stands, in your sin, you are an offense to a holy God. Your sin condemns you in his sight. And even though you may not be so bad, relatively speaking, understand that any sin is too much sin in the presence of a holy God. And breaking the smallest of his commands, you offend the whole of his character. And indeed, the God who spoke the greatest command also spoke the least command, the littlest command. And your only hope is Christ. Your only hope is the mystery that Paul was a steward of, that all who believe in Jesus will never be put to shame. The gospel, the good news, the message of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. And this means that if you believe in Christ, you will be saved. And if you are saved, you will be changed. You will be brought into the unity of the fellowship of the body of Christ, his church. You will be joined together with other sons and daughters of the King of Kings. This is the work of God. He undoes the curse of sin. He brings together those who would be most unlikely to be joined together. And yet he does this all to his glory. And brothers and sisters in Christ, understand that we are new creations. We are fellows united together no matter the diversity of our backgrounds. This is the mystery that was revealed by God to the Apostle Paul and to the other apostles and to the prophets. This is a mystery that's explained here in our passage today. And just as Paul was no innovator, we within the church today are not to innovate on the gospel. Uh, There is no new gospel. The revealed word of God, this God-breathed word, that's it. This is what we have. This is what we need. This is the standard which we ought hold one another to. And this applies, church, for your elders and pastors. I am not here to innovate. I am not here to bring you something new. I am not here to invent some new doctrine. I am here to hold up the word of God, the word made flesh, that he might draw all men to him. And as we look across the landscape of the Christian church, we have to be wary of any who acclaim new revelation. Uh, We should ignore those who bring innovations to the text of the scripture. And if there be any among us of this ilk, of this kind, we ought to do what the scripture commands us, rebuke and admonish, right? Rebuke and warn. We must not give their heresy voice. Indeed, for we know that there are false Christians, false prophets, false teachers, antichrists, even today. There are those who will come with their innovations to destroy and devour those in their midst. They are what the book of Jude describes in verses 12 and 13. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts, as they feast with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted, Wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. There are many who proclaim to know Christ, but deny him by their works. So examine yourself. Test yourself to see if you are of the faith. Ensure that you're not looking for innovative ways to cast yourself and others into hell. Instead, as you continues in verses 20 and 21, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, God, we thank you. Uh, We thank you for the mystery of Christ that has been revealed. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of your servant, your steward, the Apostle Paul, who uh, was faithful to you, who is faithful to take the message of Christ, who is faithful to take it even unto the Gentiles. 
he who was once a persecutor of you, uh, who you changed for the sake of your glory and for the good of your people. God, we thank you. We thank you for your word given to us today. Father, we thank you for your stewarding of it uh, through faithful men and women throughout the, the, the years. We thank you, Lord, for faithful men who studied your word and sought to make it in a language that we ourselves understand and to translate it as faithfully as they could. Father, we thank you. Uh, Lord, we thank you that you have saved us in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you made us who were uh, rejected, those who were outside, those who were without God, to be brought near. Father, we thank you for removing the dividing wall of hostility. We thank you, Father, for your grace towards us sinners. And Father, we pray uh, for those in our midst and for those in this community who do not know you, those who are dead in their trespasses and sins, those who are outside of, of the people of God, those who are under your judgment, who are in condemnation because of their sins. Father, we pray you would have mercy upon them. Father, we pray that you would give boldness to us to go and to preach unto them the message of reconciliation. O oh Lord, that they too might know of that work of Christ, the work done on the behalf of sinners, he who has made our propitiation, our atoning sacrifice, he who is coming again, in whose name we do pray. Amen.